think we can uh, we can start. So today we have uh, Jasmine. I said Jasmine. Jasmine. <laughs> Janina. Uh, we've been at Pierce since 2013, working with George and, and Andy. And before that, she was uh, Miguel with the Papa. Uh, talk about that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, so this is work done with, uh, under the supervision of George and Andy, also with some collaboration from Pablo Stoyas and Ed Liu, also the in-situ radar observations and simulations. Um, so I'm going to start with the satellite. The satellite view of um, clouds. So I'm going to start pretty broad. So this is. Um, the International Satellite Cloud Commentary Project. I'm sure you all have heard of it before. Um, so the, it uses passive satellite measurements to identify clouds globally. And they provide results every three hours. Right now it's from uh, 18, 1983 to 2009. There is project to extend it to more recent, using more recent observations. What is soon? <laughs> I never. A couple of months at all. We always think that, so <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll be saying that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, one project they're doing is just, well, one thing, the satellite, every pixel, you have um, a cloud top pressure and uh, the optical depth, so you have a dual point. And if you look at a region, you can get a 2D histogram of cloud top pressure versus um, optical depth, and that gives you an idea of um, the clouds, the horizontal spread of the clouds in there. Um, one project that uh, ISKIP is doing is using um, any, any global area map of 2.5 degrees by 2.5 degrees, and looking at those and just outputting all those histograms for everywhere. And one thing George has been working, George and others has been working um, previously, is to cluster those histograms um, so that it's more easy to analyze them and look um, the different weather patterns that you see over the world. Um, using the global data, they found um, 11, 11 weather state. Um, so this is um, pieces of histograms. So you have the pressure decreasing there, here, and the that increasing in the horizontal. So they found 11 clusters that are uh, independent and really different. And these are where the occurs, the 11 states plus, um, where in the whole grid box is completely clear. So you, in total, you have 12 states this way. Uh, and this is where they occur. So you can see differences. Th they really are different and they occur in different regions. And these, for example, you have a nice version of the tropical convection and the metatitle storm convection. So you can see, this is the first. And then we classify them from the convection down to the stratigraphic clouds. So the first one is a very deep uh, tower convection that you find in the tropics, the ITCZ. And the second one is convection also, but from mid-altitude systems that travels along those, the south and the, and the north hemispheres. And the other thing is that you have a nice balance also from the tropical and subtropical um, fair weather regimes. This is the seven one here, this mostly debris clouds. Um, shadow cumulus, which are low clouds and articulative and three types of spectral cumulus that you can see on the different locations right next to the coast of the ones. So how, how is the clustering done? Because like 9 and 11 look very similar both in geographical extent. And I think George is better place to answer that, but. It's like an automatic algorithm like that. It's a, uh, you know, it's a typical clustering algorithm. The only thing you have to specify is how many clusters you want to get. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. So, but for that, we try to have some more uh, objective criteria for the number of clusters. So, you start, you know, <coughs> increasing the number of 
blasters and every new one that you get, you compare it to all the old ones and you set a criteria that it needs to be a certain distance from all the old ones. If it's too close to a new one, then it's not a new one, so you stop right there. It's, it's more complicated than that, but that's the approach. You do have common guards near enough to compare them mm -hmm. like that? Also see that, so where is that twelve was clear sky? Eh? Yeah, that's totally clear. clear. So, is, so is the total cloud fraction then underpredicted by the models? That that what this means? That's kind of hard to say because you have to add all of them. But one thing you can say is that you see that MPI, which seems to not overpredict the fair weather, seven. But that's because it really overdoes the <laughs> total <laughs> clear sky, so it's yes. not that it's. Is no. this, uh, I mean, in NPR we have issues with the implementation of the ESCAP simulator. And uh, there was a study by Steve Klein. It's, we weren't the only ones. I mean, all. But uh, EU verified somehow that the data were correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's the latest that. Yeah, so sometimes 
smash because some of those are smaller grids or bigger grids, so you have to be careful with those. Yeah. So we selected two cases, so one in each, I just did eight and ten. The way we went is to um, look where those occurs predominantly, where they are like together. So this is a, this weather state ten um, case. We have like six of them together here. That's an element which is also structure cumulus. So. And on the opposite, you have the shadow cumulus case, which is under state eight. You have all this field of shadow cumulus passing over one side. And we select them in the Azores. I'll explain uh, just after that why. Um, but before I go there, um, this is uh, sea level pressure from error interim. And the analysis from my bar here um, for the storm influence. So you can see this is the region, um, the Azor region. You can see it's under the influence of the Azor high. So it's really subsidence driven. While the shadow cumulus is after the passage of the storm. So we have a cold air outbreak that just brings those shadow cumulus over the side. And why are we focusing on the Azores? Well, that's because there was a field campaign that occurred right on Graciosa, this tiny island here, <coughs> um, right next to the coast, so it has clouds coming in from the water. So, And since it's in the middle of the ocean, we assume that there's not much influence from the continent. Um, and yeah, so the campaign occurred during 2009 to 2010. You'll notice that there's only half of it that is overlapped with ISKIP right now. Um, and there was a deployment of um, various instruments to study um, processes controlling the radiative properties of microphysics uh, and microphysics of marine boundary layer clouds. So they were really focusing on the, on the boundary layers. So we have radars for finding the clouds and lidars to find where there is liquid, radiometers to look at the uh, liquid present in the water vapor and the irradiations. <coughs> And many other things. Um, just a teaser. Um, this is a 19 month view of the other materials that occurs in the Azores. Um, this is from the radar perspective. You can see this is height. So there's a, a lot of low level clouds <coughs> that's on deep uh, right, intrusion from the systems during winter time. Um, yeah, just to make sure, so I'm going back to this plot. Now the green is still uh, the global that we did before, and then black one is um, the weather state occurrence over the Azor grid cell. So you can see it looks quite similar. The main difference is in the weather state 7 and 8, which is now uh, much closer in occurrence, which is good because we find out that 8 is misrepresented misrepresented in the models, so in the Azores, you have even more of them. And if you look at the models, so this is the one that we saw before, and this is now just looking at the Azor side. <laughs> so you see similarities, which is good. So the, the Azores uh, acts, the, the models acts the same in the Azores as in overall globally. But it emphasizes the differences, the, the deficiencies here, the too many um, fair weather ones, and not enough shadow cumulus cases. And again, with the weather state um, missing here. I'm going to just um, go over the two cases separately to present them. Um, I'll start with the structure cumulus case. So these are the observations that we saw before, the this image, which I could have said it's 20 degrees by 20 degrees, it's very large, um, very large cloud field. This is the radar view for the whole day. So the cloud was present the whole day, so it's um, kind of permanent, but not permanent. <laughs> At first it's done cloud cover. It's some very old day, it's some drizzle falling out of the cloud and sometimes thinning but always present. And these are soundings 
and one taken near 12 silo and the other one at 18. So you see a persistence of the inversion that is there <coughs> and a well mixed linear layer. So, um, so we're focusing on six hours resonations um, and I'm going to 17. So these are more observations. We have I read them every uh, 13 min 30 minutes. So we have the crystal low water vapor, which is quite constant, and the liquid water path, which varies um, as the cloud thins and grows back and all that variations. Um, these are estimates of the effective radius from, um, uh, from a radiometer also, another one. You see it's around 12 microns. Um, it also estimates a number of cloud droplets, which is around 100. And the cloud fraction is pretty much constant to fully cloudy. And the optical depth, again, varies with the thinning of the clouds. This is a blow up of the modest major, so now it's only 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, a center on the Azor site. So first thing we did is simulations, uh, larger simulations with the Dharma model here at this. And so we're using a 10 by 10 kilometer domain uh, with periodic boundaries and a 100 meter resolution in the horizontal. It extends up to 2.5 kilometers with a varying resolution of between 10 and 50 meters. Um, we initialize it with the idea <coughs> with the idealized sounding taken at 11.30 Zulu. We set the CCN number to 260 per cubic centimeter. And it's a bin macrophysics with 25 bins mass doubling. This is um, histogram of occurrences of cloud base and cloud top. So the red is the base and blue is the top. So this is in the alias and this is comparing with the observations. So you can see the heights matches. The main difference is that the observation varies much more. It's kind of expected because you have various other things occurring. Um, here is um, an example of one column. So taking at one time step during the, the simulations. Uh, I'm plotting here is the reflectivity, an estimate of the reflectivity using the bins, the, the size distribution of the droplets. This is at the fixed height, and this is uh, along those two lines, taking the height versus distance. Um, you can see it's, it's similar to the observations. Um, we have a cloud growing and the sun drizzle escaping from time to time. Um, another way to look at it is taking a fixed point and using the wind just um, taking different profiles as it will pass over if it was not modified. This is the view that you will get. So to compare horizontally with the observations, I'm using this method, but by taking different, uh, different volumes, different time steps throughout. So I can make up a three hour Our figure of those hits together profiles. And comparing it to three hour from the observations, you can see that it's nice. <laughs> it's looking nice. Um, the other one is this is MODIS, so 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. I compare with the pseudo albedo computed from the LES. Um, you see similar features too, so that's some thinning. There, that you see. That's nice. <coughs> um. so, yes. mm -hmm. so the input of, uh, in the model is just uh, meteorology, basically, um, and some some aerosol assumptions. It's yes. pretty amazing that you <laughs> got well, this out. Andy could tell you more about it. I think that's. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I, I find it. Yeah, ah. it's nice. <laughs> yes, there are some differences, like yeah, of course, but y you don't get those strong cells and you don't get the tilling, but as I said, it could be coming from something else from the large scales or something like that. Um, but yeah. is, th is that the, the one on the left, top, top left? Mm -hmm. That's the model, yes, but you see some, some some thin patches in there also. Yeah. So it's just like if you sampled over these and you get thinner yeah. patches. Yeah. You can see here it's from uh, I am not sure I have yeah. to look more into it, but <coughs> it's hard to tell mm -hmm. exactly why it's thinner. So do I be those? We see some breaks in the simulated reflectivity. I wonder if that is something that corresponds to a thinning in the pseudo albedo. It's very thin break. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. The others on the other side we're also doing single column model because the whole goal is to go back to the GCMs. So now I'm comparing the observation L LAS and SCM together. Um, in black will always be the SCM, Louis observations two sources and um, uh, red is the LES which you don't see because it's underneath the blue one. <laughs> so here is the cloud fraction, the liquid order path, the rain rate, uh, the inversion height and the uh, uh, latent, uh, latent and sensible surface fluxes. Um, so what you see is the SCM. Um, it does create some cover but it loses it at some point for some reason um, but it is it has very weak li liquid in it so maybe that's why um, and on the other side is this a sounding view of it so you have the winds um, original and the electrical moment and the profiles of beta L which is the liquid water potential temperature to see the inversion, and this is the specific humidity. So one thing you notice, um, <coughs> the LES has a nice inversion throughout it, but the um, SCM has a very weak one, very um, gradual one because of its low resolution in the boundary layer. Well, you think uh, um, quantum model is uh, enormously sensitive, I mean the LS, LES as well, enormously sensitive to the initial conditions. <coughs> so, uh, um, is it 11.30 or 11.15, is that the initial time uh, for uh, uh, already in some sort of spin up? It's the initial time. Mm. Um, well, I mean, if you s very slightly change the initial profiles, you get more liquid water, I suppose. At least in my experience, yeah. Maybe one thing we did, I'll show later, uh, we increased the SCM resolution in the boundary layer and it does uh, vary things. So we're working on that. Um, we'll also investigate the, the initial condition. Mm. I mean, the nice thing about the single column model is, of course, nothing. So you can, I mean, you can run it ensembles as large as you like. Uh, I mean, perturbing the initial conditions by epsilon and plus or minus, and then you I think um, might get a, a nicer cloud to start with, and then maybe also results which are better, easier to compare to the. Well, we did more than one run initially playing around, and it never really created a nice stratagem was like. And I think, you know, you'll see what why you think it doesn't. Before we get into that, mm -hmm. I'll introduce you this second case. So again, this is the modus image I showed previously, and this is a 24-hour period of the radar. Um, one thing you see, it starts with a very deep formation, which is the front here passing over the site, and then you have some remnants. <coughs> um, this is the, this white cloud, 
and then you start with the shadow cumulus field. You have a break around 15 Zulu, which is probably like, I don't know if you see it, but between those shadow cumulus, you have sometimes a river and a black one that is like no cloud. It's only very tiny clouds that it's not really seen. Um, yeah, and in the, um, with the soundings, you can see it's not as well um, set up. It's more very in the atmosphere, it's not really set into one state. The more it's, uh, resolution is um, 500 meters, is it? Uh, you can go down to 250. Mm. Because, I mean, uh, I don't, uh, maybe uh, this is a silly question, but um, we, uh, individual cumulus we couldn't possibly see, of course. Blow up again. You can see some tiny ones <coughs> and big ones. Uh, of course, the tiny ones are harder to see because of the resolutions. And this is the scale kilometer. Hmm? Is the scale kilometer? Um, is it this is hundred hundred kilometers. It's a hundred kilometers on each side. Well, the big ones we wouldn't call cumulus. <coughs> Why not? Uh, a cumulus can't be two hundred twenty by twenty kilometers. I mean, that's not a cumulus. What do you? What would you call it? I would sort of think. I don't know. Is it liquid? I don't know. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's all liquid. I mean, <coughs> it's all liquid. Still, I mean, it's all so sure it's mm. some sort of under, I suppose. Yeah. And what was it? Th there's nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a two kilometers. Like, yeah, 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 still, but you know, the inversion. Some of those, I mean, they, 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 they just reach like 2.5 kilometers. Yeah. And they last less than an hour. Yeah. So that's why we call it. But it's also if it's producing precipitation. Yeah, it's those are all good. I mean you can show the previous one where it shows that most of them are Yeah, we already precipitate and then yeah, maybe mm -hmm. just because it passes quickly over the side. But still a really good producer of drizzle. Mm -hmm. Rain at this point, I guess. <laughs> so again, we're focusing on six hours. Now it's harder to get measurements because it's a broken field. So those measurements from the radio major, they always assume like they, they need a nice cloud cover to retrieve things. Um, so you see, it, it seems really stable at eight microns, but that's because it's a default value. <coughs> So it's harder to decide the initial condition than for the LES and SCM. <coughs> the radio mail is from the surface, is it? So the effect radius and all that effect, I mean, the, the, the peak from the surface. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we tried also from uh, satellite, it's also much really good retrievals because it's just broken field. I'm 
version might be due to something else. Um, just the issues here. Um, cloud tab also, if you don't see those tiny clouds um, that the observation app can see here. This is one time step. Um, it's big cells all over the place. 50 cc and a bit better, but still pretty much covering the whole domain. Um, yeah, it's fine. But it's still comparing the observations. Um, you see some of the activities that it reaches, just that it doesn't get those big cells that hold between them. understand the conclusion so so the conclusion would be that so to basically to improve the CRM you need a very high resolution in various layer yes yeah. yes yeah yeah, yeah. <coughs> since we're focusing on the boundary yeah. layers you need an inversion to get the cloud cover yeah but, uh, what I meant to ask is to improve the GCM basically well that's I guess not feasible, but that's uh, it's well, I, I mean, a, a 40 is the total number of nodes, isn't it? And yeah. then you add 24 in the, in the top sphere. Yeah, that's it. 
Oh, uh, okay. So the so the okay. Actually, right now, Anne is running the full GCM, just changing the boundary layer resolution. Okay. And then we're going to see what that does to the weather states, if that improves the weather state distribution. Mm -hmm. So it will improve that and mess everything else. <laughs> if we had the meeting next week, maybe we would have the results. Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's not very expensive, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, it's not cheap either. But if you see a big, if you see a big improvement, that's worth. It. Is it is it trivial to simulate the spectral width from the LES? Um, well, I, I think I tried it once, and because the 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 because um, it's a large early simulation, all the the small um, small scale motions are not are not in there, and those are in the spectral width. It's really I'm simulating the whole spectrum and then retrieving the moments. And mm -hmm. we are considering uh, turbulence to simulate this, the spectrum. Okay, and that is that a just is that in the model, or is that a assum assumption that you just have the to? Well, the LES um, gives back um, the, the edit description rate. I okay, I and that's that's how we retrieve turbulence okay. spread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, we did some work on that last year, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do I have next? Yeah, I guess. In the observation, we have some relationship between moments that seems to be really stable and that could be a goal to reach. Um, the first, the main one is a relationship between <coughs> the reflectivity and the first moment, which is the mean velocity in the spectrum. As 
as you are in the low, when you are in the low reflectivity, we have many cloud drop depths, so the velocity will be near zero, ideally, depending if you have enough drop left on, on average. And as you grow the particles, so you increase your reflectivity, the particles go bigger, and then they start falling towards the radar, so you have negative velocity, so this is the main relation. And um, so in blue is the observation. The shading is the 25 to 75 percentile to give an idea of the spread of the relationship. Um, so in the stratocumulus case, you have some overlap. It's hard to tell with the lower reflectivities if it's really uh, well uh, sample the observations and LAS it's hard to compare there but in the region where you have the more data you have an overlap so that's nice. Can you explain the LAS results? Um, <coughs> I mean the LAS and the Doppler size distribution for the particle size the uh, Doppler size distribution is, computer, is used to compute reflectivity and reflectivity essentially is uh, measure of the size of the particle or, yeah. Yeah. and the um, Doppler velocity is as well and it's also a measure of the size of the particle. So why can it be non monotonic the relationship? I'm sure. I mean why is it, why do we get a surprising result at all from the data from the model? Major. Why does it go up, for example, and as far as GT goes up? Uh, yeah, we think it just um, maybe it has too much cloud draft, like at the beginning. Mm. This, this might be just that you have those low reflectivity in the updraft, mm. while in the observation, it's more spread within the updraft and downdraft. <coughs> similarities between the two. The main difference, um, the LES has a stronger downdraft um, signature and the curve is less um, less steep in the observations. Um, the other relationship that Ed Luke at the end of found is mostly uh, between reflectivity and skewness. This skewness is the idea of the asymmetry of the peak. I'm giving you. So if it's positive, um, you have more power in the um, big from, from the big bigger particles. Well, if it's negative, you have more power from the small particles. That's where the models doesn't really work. Um, we have some very negative um, skewness. So we are looking into that. Um, we think that's, well, I think that's because um, it's producing too much drizzle, too big drizzle drops. Us. We're working on that with Andy. And so then if we don't fall in fast enough, the fall velocity of the drizzle was too little to compared to the same time. Well, it's, it's hard to tell. Reflectively weighted. Yeah, so it's, it's. You're not looking at the full. It's cloud and drizzle together. Thing. <laughs> yeah, it gets complicated when you get into that. Yeah. The last thing I can show you is um, spectrogram view. So you have um, with height. So this is my color uh, spectrum at each height. So you see the power here is from the cloud droplets. Um, and you have the drizzle that forms here. It's so far away from the cloud drop heads. It's, it looks weird to me. Um, this is a stratocumulus <coughs> case. And this is one from the shadow cumulus. And this one, like, the, the drizzle grows outside of the cloud. Maybe it's from, like, sideways clouds. I find it confusing, personally. So I'm not going to pass too much time on that. So to summarize. <laughs> <laughs> so those are... 
Those are with any air motion that's inside of the cloud. This isn't just ball speed. No, no, it, it's with the air motion. You can see that's uh, the dash line is the air motion, and the black line is the mean Doppler velocity measure measured by your radar. So you're estimating it with the right edge of the spectrum of the observation. Mm -hmm. the, the dotted line in the observations is, is from the edge of the spectrum. So it's well, the dotted line is uh, what the LES gives us. Oh, right, the in, the, in the observations. A no, th this is all simulations. Oh, that's all simulations? This is all simulations. So this is the structure cumulus, and this uh -huh. is the shutter cumulus case. I'm sorry. I didn't have time to.
show the 68 of the highest one. So even at the highest one, mm -hmm. you know, the strategy in this case where we have 100 everywhere for the areas is more between 50 and, uh, and 80, 90. And uh, for the broken case, it goes between 5 and... So it's not really as good as the, the red. And then the liquid water paths, for example, in the shallow cumulus case are still much lower both from the observed and the uh, and the LES ones. Uh, it's okay, it's better in the, the shallow cumulus case. Um, so that it is better than the low resolution, but it's not in any of the aspects, it's not reaching the LES representation. A major issue here is that the PBL in, in the Model E is still not uh, moist. So so the cloud is, is treated by the cloud, uh, by Tony and Yao uh, separately, mm -hmm. the cloud part. The PBL is, is still uh, basically dry with some uh, uh, virtual uh, variables, but still dry. So uh, I, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, Incorporate the condensation physics into the current TPL following a uh, uh, Bradleton and Park in Hancock 2009 2014. So, James, I think you've done a very good work, and uh, probably I will consult you and uh, in, the, in the effort of how to improve these things uh, using single current model. Sure. Well, the moment that it's implemented in the SEM, we can rerun those things with the, yeah. the moist boundary layer and see right. how much difference it makes. It, 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 it's a, the, the work amount is, is huge though. <laughs> they, they have uh, 10,000 lines for, 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 for